Hello and welcome to Long COVID Foundation podcast. At the Long COVID Foundation, our vision is to improve health and well-being of long COVID sufferers by contributing to long COVID diseases understanding and treatment options. And to do this, we work with organizations and individuals of medical profession, scientists and researchers at the long COVID interest groups. And we also promote the long-standing symptoms, health and rehabilitation challenges. And today I would like to welcome Alex Manos, who is a co-founder of Health Path Company that offers gut tests and provides personalized advice. Alex is a certified functional medicine practitioner with an MSc in personalized nutrition and a degree in nutritional therapy. Alex completed his MSc dissertation on glucocorticoid resistance in chronic fatigue syndrome and has a special interest in gut health and mold-related illnesses. So Alex, thank you very much for being with us today. It's such a great honor to have you on our channel. It's a pleasure to be here, guys. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for being here. At the same time, I would like to welcome Dr. Mark Fabrowski, who is a UK certified family medicine practitioner who himself has struggled with long COVID. He's also one of our medical advisors at the Long COVID Foundation. So, Mark, great to have you with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Alex, uh, I know you have some slides to share, but uh, be before we go into presentation. Um, could you give a, a little bit information about the health path and how it was established so we know a little bit more uh, how you tackle these diseases? Health path is approximately three years old now. Um, it was actually set up by an old client of mine. Um, I was working with a client who worked in the sort of financial sector and was struggling a lot with um, severe chronic back pain. He was being heavily medicated. He had severe constipation. Um, he was going, I think, on average about once a week for a bowel movement. And he had numerous other symptoms as well. And over the period of probably a, a year or two, um, he started to see his health turn around. He was able to get off some of his painkillers. Um, he had better gut health, essentially. And he was... I guess just amazed by the role that sort of lifestyle medicine, integrative medicine, functional medicine, whatever you want to call it, um, played within his health journey. Um, he didn't really get anywhere from a, a conventional perspective, apart from really symptom management. So which that was obviously essential and important for him to get him back to work and to be able to function. But it didn't really get to the root of what was going on. Um, and over time, he started to understand that there was a different way um, so he actually quit his job and as a entrepreneur sort of sold his house, sold everything he had to, to put into Health Path. And that was around three years ago. Um, and Health Path has grown since then. We still very much focus on the gut. So we offer stool testing to look at the gut microbiome. Uh, we offer SIBO breath testing to look for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, we look at leaky gut testing. And we have a couple of other tests looking at food sensitivity and um, adrenal function, looking at salivary cortisol as well. So we've got sort of five tests that we offer to um, the public um, so they can visit our website. They can order tests. And then we've got a team of nutritional therapists that are looking at those test results, looking at symptom surveys that our customers complete. And based on that sort of what I just described as subjective and objective information, uh, they create programs to support people understand what's driving those symptoms and also be able to restore balance to those imbalances detected. I see. Seems very useful uh, because in long COVID we clearly see there is a uh, gut microbiome has been affected significantly and it's certainly we're very interested to, to learn more from you, how you do it and what you find. So if you could share your screen please for us. So yeah, we're gonna be exploring the connection really between COVID and the gut microbiome. So we've just introduced Health Path um, and really the objectives of the slides are to, to help us summarize the research that we have to date linking these two things. And I'm gonna finish by sharing an ongoing case study that um, I'm supporting someone who has long COVID using gut testing to sort of hopefully bring this to life a little bit as well. Okay. 
So I like to break down the gut into four components in regards to what we can actually evaluate. So when we think about gut health and gut function, we can think about digestive capacity, which is really referring to is someone producing enough digestive enzymes and gastric juices to digest and break down their foods. We can think about the structure of the gut. And what I'm referring to there is both sort of the microvilli, which often get described as finger-like protrusions. Um, the analogy often is if you think of a brand new carpet, it's nice and fluffy, and you can think of those individual strands of the carpet. But as you walk from door to door, those little strands of the carpet get worn away. And this is something that can happen in, for example, SIBO, small intestine bacterial overgrowth. But from a, more of a testing perspective, when we think about the structure of the gut, we can think about the integrity of the gut and this concept of leaky gut or intestinal permeability. The ecosystem is referring to all the different bugs that we can find there. And that's not just bacteria, but that is also yeasts, it's also viruses, and it's also parasites. We have this huge ecology, especially within our large intestine, um, where we have a vast amount of research uh, linking the gut to numerous conditions, bodily organs and bodily systems. And then you can think about the products that these bugs are producing. Uh, that can range from certain vitamins through to things called short chain fatty acids that we can use as a source of energy and that are important for our immune system. And again, for the integrity of the gut lining. So when we think about these four components of the gut, we can then go to the research and see what's there in each of these four things. So I thought we would start by just sort of summarizing a little bit of the background knowledge on the gut microbiome and viral infections generally, because there are a couple of key things that I think are worth highlighting before we dive specifically into COVID. So what we know through the research that has sort of, I guess, taken place over many years now is that viral infections and how viruses replicate can be influenced by organisms that live in that local vicinity. So you may have a virus, for example, in the liver uh, and the organisms around there will have an influence on the virus. But we also see that this can happen from a distal perspective or a, a long distance perspective, meaning that, for example, respiratory viruses have been shown to create imbalances within the gut microbiome. So different bodily sites seem to be interconnected. And this has led to a lot of research um, on various gut organ axes. The one that we could focus on today is obviously the gut lung axis, but you can find lots of research on the gut brain axis, the gut muscle axis, the gut bone axis, the gut liver axis, the gut kidney axis. I even saw one paper recently that was talking about the gut eye axis. So we're starting to understand that the gut microbiome and the metabolism metabolites or products that these organisms are producing seem to have an impact on distal sites of the body, uh, many of which we've just listed. And most of these axes seem to be bi-directional, meaning that a infection in the respiratory tract or the lungs has been shown to influence the microbiome, but our gut microbiome can influence the trajectory of that viral infection as well. So we can um, essentially manipulate both ends of this axis. So when we consider this kind of guts lung axis concept within the context of COVID, we can actually take it one step further because we obviously now know that COVID can be found within the guts. In fact, uh, all the content from these slides are direct quotes from the research papers that you'll see on the right hand side of the slide. And in this paper, they talked about how the gut can actually act as a reservoir for SARS-CoV-2. And we see this in numerous papers and there's plenty of research correlating um, the severity of COVID and the GI symptoms associated with COVID with this fact. So we see prolonged fecal shedding in infected patients. And this has been shown in a study published this year to be happening seven months after the infection. This seems to be quite a long-term finding. We're not talking about just days or weeks anymore. 
And this paper from the BMJ Open essentially indicated that those um, hospitalized should be tested from a stool perspective. And there should be, um, I guess, policies in place to protect individuals who are still showing fecal shedding of the virus. And we see that COVID disrupts the gut microbiome. So this ecosystem in our large intestine can change as a result of the infection. But not only that, but we see the integrity of the gut, going back to this concept of leaky gut, being a factor as well. Now, some of the more um, sort of observational research has also suggested that the health of our microbiome at the time of infection may impact our prognosis. So there are various things that can impact the health of our microbiome, ranging from our long-term diet to how many courses of antibiotics we have used to our stress levels, our sleeping patterns, our activity habits, physical exercise correlates with a healthy gut microbiome. Among other factors, all of these are going to influence the health of your gut microbiome, and that is gonna have an impact on the severity of the infection. So this again is just further evidence that there's a really intimate connection between the two. So again, just putting a quote from the research, we see associations between the composition of our microbiome and levels of cytokines, which are just pro-inflammatory molecules produced by various immune cells with COVID-19, suggesting that the gut microbiome is involved in the magnitude of COVID-19 severity. Now, the mechanism behind this is partly related to the fact that all of these different bacteria produce metabolites. A lot of those metabolites are produced by the fermentation of our food. So for example, butyrate is a short chain fatty acid. Certain bacteria produce it in response to fermenting the fiber within our diet. And butyrate modulates our immune system. It has anti-inflammatory properties. It's actually the main food for our colonocytes, which are the cells that line the colon. And therefore, in individuals with low butyrate production, they're at increased risk of this concept of leaky gut, which we're gonna to touch on in a little bit more detail in a second. So let's just look at some of the actual specifics that we see in the research related to the microbiome. Um, in one study, we saw a change in what we refer to as the firmicute to the bacterioid ratio. These are two types of phyla of bacteria. So think of these as just families. Um, this is a ratio that it, most stool labs will look at. It is a marker of dysbiosis, and dysbiosis refers to an imbalance within your microbiome. But we also see a decreased abundance of these butyrate-producing bacteria that we've just touched on. We see a lower abundance of another family or phylum of bacteria called actinobacteria, and we see an increase in the abundance of proteobacteria. Proteobacteria are sometimes referred to as gram-negative bacteria, uh, which essentially also means they have something on their surface called LPS for short, which just stands for lipopolysaccharides. And this LPS is very pro-inflammatory if it's able to cross a leaky gut wall, which is again something we see in many people with COVID. There's also research showing us that those with COVID have elevated levels of calprotectin, which is an inflammatory marker in the colon. When calprotectin reaches a certain point, it's used in stool testing to differentiate irritable bowel syndrome from inflammatory bowel disease. So calprotectin, when elevated, is showing us there's inflammation in that large intestine, which is going to increase the likelihood of leaky gut, and it's also going to often contribute to various symptoms that we would associate with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome, ranging from abdominal pain to bloating to diarrhea, amongst others. So these authors actually said that calprotectin measurement could play a potential role in monitoring the disease. 
We then have a bacteria called Fecalibacterium prosnitzi. This is referred to as a keystone species. And all that really means is, it's really, really important. <laughs> um, Fecalibacterium can make up to five to 8% of our overall microbiome. So it's quite a prominent organism within an ecosystem. Uh, and research has found an inverse correlation between this specific bacteria and COVID-19. Fecalibacterium is a butyrate producer, which we've already discussed in a little bit of detail. And partly as a result of that, it's known as having quite a potent anti-inflammatory benefit, which makes sense that if this organism is low and we're seeing calprotectin elevated in a subset of those with COVID, we can see uh, some of the reasons why. But we also evaluate the mycobiome rather than the microbiome. The microbiome is the yeasts that we all have within our large intestine. But what some research has found is that patients with COVID-19 have alterations to their microbiome. We're seeing elevated levels of candida albicans within the intestine. And again, this can contribute to various symptoms from an IBS perspective. And then just really to touch on this concept of leaky gut more, um, it's still not necessarily accepted in a conventional medicine perspective, but there is a huge amount of research that we now have on this concept. And leaky gut is the informal name, metabolic endotoxemia is the sort of slightly more official name, but the, the concept essentially is that our gut lining, uh, I refer to this as if you think of your digestive tract as a hose pipe, the hose pipe should be selectively permeable or selectively leaky. It should allow through certain things, vitamins and minerals, amino acids and other things, but it should prevent the travel of um, other things through it. So it's selecting what comes through. The leaky gut is just this idea that the hose pipe has become excessively leaky. Things are getting through that shouldn't be. And many of these things we know trigger the immune system which leads to inflammation. And that low level systemic inflammation has been associated with a very long list of conditions. If chronic, it has been associated with depression. Uh, it's been associated with autoimmunity. It's been associated with chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and really the list goes on. So the concept here is that something like COVID can contribute to a disruption in your microbiome and changes to that ecosystem, to your microbiome, along with inflammation, such as the elevated calprotectin that we mentioned, induces excessive leakiness to the lining of the guts, our hose pipe, and that contributes to chronic low-grade systemic inflammation that then contributes to fatigue, brain fog, and a long list of symptoms. So interestingly, something that I, I actually admittedly only stumbled across very recently is the concept or another mechanism. So one of the mechanisms we've, met, we've mentioned is that the gut microbiome produces metabolites. Those metabolites modulate our systemic immune system, which then can have a positive or negative impact on things like lung health, liver health, etc. But many of us are now obviously very familiar with the concept of the ACE2 receptor as well. We have a lot of these receptors in our gut, and the receptors have a role to play within maintaining homeostasis to our amino acids, in particular an amino acid called tryptophan. They have a role to play within the expression of antimicrobial proteins and our general balance of the gut microbiome. So if we have COVID, interacting with these receptors, it means that we have less receptors available to absorb tryptophan. And tryptophan is a precursor to serotonin. Serotonin is a precursor to melatonin. So that entire metabolic pathway, I imagine, can potentially be compromised. Now, there's quite a lot of research um, looking at tryptophan and its metabolic pathway from a chronic fatigue syndrome perspective, for example. It may impact mood and depression-based conditions as well. So this is just another mechanism that might lead into essentially uh, COVID or, or long COVID symptoms. Um, so the dysbiotic or the imbalanced gut microbiome that persists after disease resolution 
could be a factor in developing persistent symptoms or multi-system inflammation syndromes. And just as really an FIY sort of aside notes here, uh, again, there's research discussing certain medications that we might need to be mindful of. So widespread use of glucocorticoids, which are used in certain inflammatory GI or gut disorders. Um, also proton pump inhibitors or antacids have been linked to severe clinical outcomes of COVID-19. Now these sorts of medications are known in the research to influence the gut microbiome. And that's probably uh, why we see that connection there. So with all that in mind, obviously probiotics are just one of the, the tools in our toolkit that we can consider when we think about supporting the gut and our immune system. Um, and we've already seen the research showing us that there are quite significant imbalances within the microbiome in those suffering with COVID. Uh, this quote um, essentially refers to the fact that supporting or bolstering those friendly bacteria that have become depleted in COVID-19 could serve as a novel avenue to mitigate severe disease, essentially saying that probiotics have a role to play within modulating um, our immune system and having an impact on our prognosis, ultimately. So we have, I think, 12 studies currently taking place that are looking at specific strains or species of probiotic in COVID. Um, this study looked at a probiotic that included Bacillus subtilis, Enterococcus faecalis, and Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG. The third one and final one, the rhamnosus GG, is one of the most researched probiotics in the world. It's got extensive evidence behind it for lots of different things. Ultimately, what this study found was that probiotic supplementation uh, resulted in an eightfold decreased rate of respiratory failure compared to 42 patients receiving only medical treatment. Um, I'm not aware of probiotic on the market that specifically contains all three of these organisms, but they are available. So you may have to get more than one product, ultimately, if you did want to try and get all three of those um, bacteria. Um, then there's also one that in the research is referred to as SLAB51. Uh, this is just a probiotic um, that is widely available on the market. And what they found was essentially the, those that were supplementing the probiotic had higher chances of survival and a reduced risk of developing respiratory failure. And they also theorized that this is because it contains enzymes that could reduce oxygen consumption in the intestine, making it available for other organs, which I thought was a really interesting um, concept. So as I say, if you were to even just Google Slab 51 probiotic, you will find uh, various websites that stock it. Um, apologies, I should have put sort of um, the, the generic name of the probiotic I have found. I, I might be able to get it before we, uh, we finish, though, for everyone interested. Um, and then again, just more research, this time with a probiotic formula called SIM01 to show us that probiotics seem to be helpful in reducing pro-inflammatory markers, reducing nasopharyngeal viral loads, and really modulating the immune system and restoring that ecosystem in the gut back to a sort of healthier state. So with all that in mind, let's just kind of try and bring this to life and I'll, I'll bring in our stool test so you can see the connections between some of what we've discussed in the research um, and what we test. So this is a case study of someone, we initially uh, tested his stool in January um, he had been struggling for approximately 15 months from memory. And we can see here that his pH was actually slightly on the acidic side of things. And his diversity score was a three, which is quite low. Uh, to give you context, we want to see a minimum of a five. So from a diversity perspective, we've already discussed how this is something that has been found in the research. So that wasn't too surprising. He also had slightly high proteobacteria. Uh, you can see that towards the end of the um, visual on this page. And he had low actinobacteria, 
Both things we discussed earlier have been found in the research in those suffering with COVID. Now, he also had an organism called Prevotella copri, which came back very high. In fact, 44% of the Prevotella was this specific species. And Prevotella copri has been associated with autoimmune conditions. It's thought by some to be a bit of an environmental trigger, for example. And we know that levels that high are unusual. So we felt that this was certainly going to be contributing to some of his GI symptoms because it's a potentially pro-inflammatory organism, especially at those sorts of levels. Butyrate. Two butyrate producing bacteria coming back low. So for him, it didn't look like the butyrite side of things was too much of a problem. His microbiome, meaning those yeasts, the candida albicans that we mentioned early was normal. And there wasn't any noticeable inflammation in his large intestine as his calprotectin was actually normal. His zonulin, which is a marker in the stool for leaky guts, this idea of intestinal permeability was normal, but it was at the higher end of the reference range. So we had a bit of a question mark around whether there could actually still be a little bit of leaky guts going on based on his overall results. We tested him three months later, and you can see on the right hand side here that he's now at a four. So he's gone from a three to a four. We really want a five at a minimum. So we're moving very much in the right direction from that perspective. That microbiome diversity is improving. And microbiome diversity is discussed in the research as really the most important marker of gut health. Uh, the analogy is often something like the Amazonian rainforest or any really any natural ecosystem. The more diverse the ecosystem, the more resilient and stable it is to any perturbation. So a perturbation being a stressor, an example of a stressor for the microbiome could be a course of antibiotics that you have to go on or some form of gut infection that you pick up traveling, for example. So he's got basically a more resilient microbiome as a result of the fact that his diversity has improved. His pH went from being slightly acidic to now being in the optimal reference range. His dysbiosis index, which is literally the number of imbalances found within the test, improved by 25%. His proteobacteria was now normal. It was elevated, as we often find in COVID patients. And actinobacteria was still low. So there was some room for improvement from that perspective. Prevotella copri was significantly lower. The normal markers from his first test were still normal, uh, which is obviously good to see. His zonulin, however, was still at the higher end and actually a little bit higher. So that we still had a question mark around leaky gut. And since his first test, we've actually added a few markers to the gut test. So we now look at what we refer to as digestive residues, which are basically the level of fat sugar and protein and water in the stool to give us an indication of whether someone's malabsorbing or maldigesting their nutrients. Uh, he had normal levels of fat and protein, but he did have elevated levels of sugar in the stool, indicating a degree of carbohydrate malabsorption. Now, that could be to lactose from, for example, milk. That could be from fructose uh, from fruit. Or it could actually just be from sucrose as well. One of those three or more uh, he is having issues with from a, a digestion perspective. So possible interventions and some of the things that we did with this case. Now, prebiotics, we can think about from a dietary and supplement perspective. Prebiotics in our diet come from various vegetables, various fruits, various whole grains, among other things as well. So you can see a list of some of the more well-known ones on the bottom right visual here. We can um, be slightly more personalized with our prebiotic recommendations from a supplement perspective. So for example, a prebiotic called galactooligosaccharides or GOS for short, has been shown to particularly increase bifidobacteria. Most of us are familiar with bifidobacteria because it's often in probiotics that we might buy. Bifidobacteria is a bacteria within the actinobacteria family. Now, if you remember in the research, actinobacteria is often low in people with COVID and it was low in this case study. So GOS, they particularly helpful prebiotic for uh, this example. 
and when there are others that you can consider supplementing as well. We've discussed the use and the evidence behind probiotics in COVID. Polyphenols are plant-based compounds. Polyphenols are what give food their color. So there's a cheesy saying, which is eat the rainbow a day. You know, the different colored foods contain different polyphenols and these different polyphenols have different health benefits. And polyphenols are essentially prebiotic, but through a different sort of mechanism. A lot of prebiotics like garlic, leeks and onion uh, those of you that might have gone on to something like a low FODMAP diet know that they're quite fermentable and that fermentation can create a lot of gas in the guts and that gas can contribute to bloating and abdominal pain and, and constipation and diarrhea and things like this. The advantage of polyphenols is that they don't really get fermented, but they still support the diversity and the abundance of our microorganisms. Dietary fibre. You know, there's research indicating that we should be aiming for 30 different plant foods per week. That seems to be the sweet spot to really support the microbiome. And there is actually evidence and research showing us that dietary fiber seems to improve and support the activity of antiviral and immunosuppressive drugs. And then diversity, which we've just touched on. So 30 different plant foods a week as a minimum. That's fruit, veg, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, lentils, pulses, beans, herbs, and spices. Now you might not tolerate all of those, but that's okay. We still have a long list of foods that we can consider supporting. And by doing that, you're likely going to be ticking the boxes around dietary fiber, polyphenols, and prebiotics. Um, one thing I didn't mention was probiotic foods, which you'll again see in the top right visual here. So these are your fermented foods, things like kefir, sauerkraut, kombucha, kimchi. These are things that are becoming really easy to access. Even our supermarkets now stock most of these. Um, and these have been shown to improve the diversity of our microbiome when consumed consistently. So I'm a big fan of adding these to our diet on really a daily basis as a way to support a really healthy, diverse, resilient microbiome. Um, this paper that got published last year also discussed uh, the potential role of curcumin, vitamin C, uh, glycerizic acid, which is a, a compound from licorice root, vitamin D and vitamin E as other possible interventions that may be helpful. So I just to give us, I guess, a bit of context of where we're at. Uh, this is from a paper that, again, I think came out last year. Um, and they concluded that there is currently clinical evidence gathering to indicate that modulation of the gut microbiome can positively influence COVID-19 disease progression. This is supported by reported positive effects of probiotics against other coronavirus strains. And I've already mentioned that there are, I believe, at least 12 studies on the way uh, around the world investigating specific strains of probiotic and their potential efficacy uh, in reducing inflammation, modulating the immune system, in the integrity of that gut lining. So everything that we have been discussing today. Um, I found this paper this morning, so I thought I'd add it as a bit of a reference slide. I'm happy for people to either take a screenshot or we can get the slides to people or reach out to us if you've got questions, obviously. Uh, but this kind of summarizes the specific products that have been trialed. So you'll see um, either the specific strain of bacteria or sometimes even, for example, Actimel, the fermented drink that you can buy. Um, so this just gives people a little bit of a reference, hopefully, of things that can be considered as well, that has some evidence behind them. So there's a little bit of a whirlwind tour, but I'm mindful of time. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope that's been helpful. That was brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, I have some questions. I don't know about you, Valentina. Uh, I'll let you go first. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much. So you've talked thank about you, a number Alex. of cases. You've talked about a number of case studies already. Um, this ties in nicely with what Dr. Leo Galland was saying a few days ago at our last Congress on the gut-brain axis. Um, in terms of people who you've helped, who might have had COVID, long COVID, 
have they recovered in terms of their long COVID or is it more their gut that has recovered? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have like a really long list of people that I have supported, but there's definitely kind of a bit of both. Um, so using the case study here, um, this gentleman has improved in both facets. Um, in fact, his guts, he didn't have sort of prominent gut symptoms. He had basically read the research, aware that there was a connection and was trying to, as you can imagine, to do everything he can to, to ensure optimal recovery. And he has found uh, noticeable benefits in sort of his systemic health. Um, he wasn't just doing the gut. And actually, one thing I wanted to say at the beginning was I would view supporting the gut obviously as a piece of the overall puzzle um, so I don't think it's necessarily something that if you were only doing gut work um, will it shift the needle as much as if obviously you're doing everything else that you may need to be doing um, so I think it's important just to kind of highlight that you know it's, it's again it's a tool within the toolkit um, but there are people absolutely who have noticed that it's been a noticeable it's been of noticeable benefit from Alex, is that sustained or is that for a while that they've noticed it, do you know? Oh, I guess only time will tell, unfortunately. Um, I don't, I haven't spoken to anyone directly who's said they've sort of um, had any decline. But again, I'm not, I haven't spoken to a high number of cases. So it's, you know, it's a very small sample size. Great. I know a number of clinicians who initially used to think that the gut, protecting the gut, taking care of it to help other diseases too, was a lot of rubbish. I think the last few Congresses and today's presentation totally counter that. So thank you so much. I hope a number of my colleagues will be able to see that too. In terms of helping other diseases, such as MCAS, muscle activation syndrome, um, other autoimmune type illnesses, have you noticed that you've been able to help people with those type of illnesses too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's there's so much evidence now showing us that the gut is modulating systemic health um, through lots of different mechanisms. So I just don't think we can debate this anymore. And there's absolutely um, evidence and, you know, thousands of case studies and anecdotal evidence showing us that improving gut health as a way to puts an autoimmune disease into remission, for example, mm -hmm. is absolutely possible. Um, it's again, not the be all and end all. So it's not sort of a, a magic pill. I'm always, um, always like to push that point because the gut isn't, you know, it isn't an isolated organ from everything else. So for example, we do also see clients and customers whereby they have significant gut issues they go through some of these sort of interventions that we know are really helpful in restoring health to the gut. And they don't necessarily work always. You know, they have a good success rate, but they're absolutely people that do all of these kind of, let's just say, gut healing protocols and are still kind of where they were at the beginning. And there are times when I think there's something going on systemically, which is actually driving the imbalances in the gut, which mean until you deal with that other thing, you're not going to see the improvement in gut health. Hence, we said at the beginning that these axes, like the gut-lung axis, the gut-brain axis, they're bi-directional. Um, so we might want to be supporting the gut, but we need to be thinking about other things as well. So the epstein bar virus has been discussed a lot as a trigger of certain autoimmune conditions, for example. So you might need some... Um, you might need interventions that are more specific as an antiviral, um, rather than just trying to kind of deal with that through the gut. So a multi-pronged approach is always going to be needed. Sure. I think you mentioned that people may have depression, for example, and their gut may be influencing that too. Some people with depression may have something circumstantial happening, some really awful family personal event, which obviously the gut trying to supplement or try to make that optimal is not going to help much. But in terms of people who have a more innate, organic type of depression. Have you had examples where people have improved that and therefore have been able to come off their antidepressants or medicines? Yeah, I think it's always tricky to say because when you're taking sort of an integrative medicine approach, you're, you're often doing several things. 
So, you know, you're supporting the gut alongside discussing physical activity, sunshine, mm. etc. So, you know, I'm always hesitant to push things just on improving the gut as the thing that shifted things. Um, the way I would probably frame it is, you know, done alongside anything else that we feel needs to be done from that lifestyle perspective, we definitely see improves things. I mean, I have, um, I have examples sort of within my family that I can think of that are a prime example of how dietary changes and improvement of the gut have noticeable impacts on our moods. Um, I mean, I went through a, a phase probably five years ago of, of having these acute flares of anxiety. And it was very generalized. You know, it was in environments where I could be watching TV. I remember one, I was driving home to see my parents and I have, you know, a good, strong relationship with them. But I'd have this really strong just wave of anxiety and I could literally feel it coming up, um, sort of up from the stomach through the chest. And there was one time on a train that I almost had to get off the train, but I was just about able to kind of breathe my way through it and sort of settle things. But I did a gut test. Um, because I was having gut symptoms at the time as well. And I had a bacteria called Klebsiella pneumoniae that came back incredibly high in that test. And we know that this is again a pro inflammatory organism. It's got research discussing it as an environmental trigger of ankylosing spondylitis, for example. Um, and going through a very basic sort of gut healing program using probiotics and antibacterial herbs like oregano oil. I've never had any of those sorts of experiences again. And, and that was the only thing that I did because I felt like everything else was kind of really in place. So although not obviously chronic depression, um, for me, that was a great example of the gut brain axis ultimately. And do you feel that the Klebsiella is normalized now? Yeah, so on retesting Klebsiella was in normal reference ranges. Um, I will add to that, again, you know, there are so many nuances to this, having worked with people with ankylosing spondylitis where we've got them off medications, but actually on retesting, Klebsiella and Uni were still at the same levels. And what this shows us is, and what some of the research discusses, is sometimes it's not necessarily just about the amount of the organism you have, but the relationship that you, the host, have with the organism. And you can manipulate that relationship by manipulating the overall ecosystem. So research suggests, sort of discusses that you might have a parasite, but if that parasite is found within a microbiome that's really diverse and healthy, it won't cause you any problems. But that parasite in a microbiome that's kind of, I describe it as impoverished, it's now a very small um, restricted microbiome, that might actually contribute to someone's sort of ongoing symptoms. So there's a lot of context that sometimes has to be applied to this as well. Alex, in this example just now, do you think that correlation is not necessarily causation? Could it have been something else? Yeah, I think there's there's always that kind of question, I think. You know, it's, but health is so complex and the body is so complex and all of our systems are, I describe, just dancing with one another. And there's it's health or and disease, it's a moving target. So we're using these tests not in a diagnostic way. We're using them to look at trends and themes in the research in that microbiome that give us a really strong sort of hypothesis that, okay, we know in the evidence, this is what's discussed and shared. This is what we're seeing in your results. This is what we can um, come up with as a hypothesis. And this is what we know we can do to modify it. So it, there's definitely always that question of, well, what else could be going on? And um, that's a challenge from a clinical perspective, for sure. Sure, sure. We had Leo Garland a few days ago talking about his eight steps in re-establishing the gut-brain access. Um, and we had Carla Bronya a couple of months prior to that saying in acute COVID and long COVID, he has different suggestions for what may be given. In long COVID, depending on whether somebody may have a penicillin allergy or not, someone may be on rifaximin, for example. I know some medicines such as comoxiclav can result in clostridium difficile. And I've looked at their proposals, they seem watertight. However, I guess as a clinician, I've got to look at other sides of the coin too, thinking, mm -hmm. is there a risk that C. diff may come about? Do you have any experience of people who may have had antibiotics to uh, get rid of viral res reservoirs to shed the gut lining? And have come into problems or have they mostly been okay? Um, 
we've only really had people come to us um, who have been symptomatic from a course of antibiotics for whatever reason, um, and then sometimes tested for sort of C. diff there. So we haven't had anyone come to us using antibiotics from a viral perspective and then finding it, if that makes sense. Um, C. diff isn't a standard part of our testing. Um, so it's not something that we do. We can do it and it's been requested sometimes, um, but it's, it's not a standard thing. Um, the, our main experience with antibiotics is really more from a SIBO perspective. Um, so obviously rifaximin is used um, as one of the go-tos for people with small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Um, so we sometimes refer to GPs um, to prescribe antibiotics from that perspective when our customers or clients want to sort of go down that route. Okay, thank you. You've also mentioned that there was some supplement you were going to mention for us. If, you, if it comes to mind, please let us know afterwards if you don't have it to hand and we can include it. Um, but why would you recommend that specifically? I think it was, um, it was more um, from the context of it has evidence behind it at this point in time, specifically from a COVID perspective. So it's, it's not one that I would recommend, um, how should I put this? It's not one I would recommend sort of generically for someone with long COVID, but if someone's having uh, respiratory issues, if they're struggling with kind of oxygen delivery to the cell circulation, then that probiotic might be one to consider because of the evidence behind it. Whereas if someone doesn't have that sort of specific part of their sort of symptomatology, then something more like Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, which we mentioned a couple of times that's been um, used in the research, I think is probably a better fit because it's more research, it's got, from my perspective, more mechanisms of action. So it will be helping with the gut lining. Uh, it does have kind of immune modulatory properties. So that would be more, um, a, more a more frequently recommended probiotic. Thank you. I've got one more question, if that's all right. Of course. Um, so before I pass on to Valentina, so I think what you do is great. I think to link any correlations and work on your own gut bacteria to hopefully help restore or ameliorate other systems is good. I know that many of our followers may have had long COVID for a while, are suffering a lot, well, either long COVID or other post-viral conditions. They may have lost their jobs, they may have, you know, they might be in a financial rut, as they were. The NHS, I don't think anytime soon, is going to include this in their standard panel of tests. In terms of what you do compared to other organizations that do similar, why should people come to you? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a common question. Um, I think we are slightly different to most gut tests on the market um, in the sense that a lot of them are looking just at organisms and looking at kind of the amount of the organism that is there. The way that I frame it is our test, I think, is just a little bit more kind of clinically helpful because we're looking at pancreatic elastase, which is a marker around, is someone producing enough digestive enzymes from the pancreas? Uh -huh. We're looking at those digestive residues to see, is there excessive fat, sugar, or protein in the stool? We're looking at calprotectin, which some of the stool tests do out there, but some of the cheaper ones, to the best of my knowledge, don't look at. So those what I um, what often refer to as functional markers, I think is one of the things that stands us apart. And that's kind of who, that's what Health Path is about. We, we were set up to help people with chronic ongoing symptoms. We didn't want to offer a test that was kind of more about health optimization or just wanting to know how you can increase the abundance of specific organisms. It was more like, okay, you have these symptoms, let's see if we can understand and make some connections based on your test data um, that might explain why you're actually experiencing these symptoms. Um, so I think those functional markers stand us apart. And then obviously we create programs based on all of that information. Um, and although this has been changing, I think there are still some gut tests out there where you kind of get your information, but they don't necessarily give you a huge amount around what to do about it, maybe a probiotic or more, but we're trying to offer a slightly more um, in-depth support. Got you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was a very informative discussion. Uh, I, I might have just a couple of thanks to, uh, to ask in terms of 
overall for long haulers, um, what do you have in your toolkit that is most effective for people? Because I know you can do any test and you can find something in it, but for long haulers specifically, what particular test can you offer them? So, I mean, the world is our oyster here in some ways. So working with a practitioner, you can obviously do different types of gut testing, but we can look at nutrient status. We can look at some of these neurotransmitter pathways like the tryptophan pathway. Uh, there's testing referred to as organic acid testing that can help from that perspective. Um, we can do additional viral testing. We can do hormone testing. We can look at the blood brain barrier. Um, there's a lot of tests that are available. Um, there's a saying in functional medicine, though, which is treat the individual, not the disease, uh, meaning that we don't say I have long COVID, what tests should I consider? We think, OK, this is your life story. This is the medications you've used. These are the stresses you've had, et cetera. These are the diets you've been on. Based on that information, we feel that these tests are most appropriate because your life story suggests that these imbalances are most likely so it's kind of shifting it to the person rather than sort of the diagnosis. And that for me is quite liberating as a practitioner. Um, but it's also quite empowering because it's really putting the person at the, the center of the process rather than sort of what I sometimes call the label or the diagnosis. Um, so that's where kind of the world really is our oyster. It's kind of like, well, there's lots of things we can consider. So you, you would, I'm sure, heard of the... Uh, the study that has found that, for example, some people with long COVID, EBV has been um, found to be sort of reactivated. So in some people, it's actually, actually more of an EBV issue now, the Epstein-Barr virus, uh, rather than COVID per se. So you can go and do some slightly more comprehensive EBV testing, for example. There's, um, there's a couple of really great labs. One of them is Arm Armin Labs in Germany um, that do a lot of some of these kind of testing. Um, so yes, I mean, almost if you want to test it, there's probably a company out there that is able to be accessed by a practitioner or directly by the public. Um, it's just really asking the question, is it going to be the most, is it going to be the best use of your money for starters? Um, is it yes, exactly. Public? So th this is the most concerning, I think, point when people attend conferences and read studies and there are so many things that people can do. but what is the beginning, where people should start. And um, we see that many now develop neurological issues. And uh, maybe I think the test that you offer for to check tryptophan is uh, something that uh, may be the key for, for those who develop neurological symptoms uh, during long COVID. But then after the test, uh, what advice you give to people with uh, tryptophan serotonin levels disrupted? I mean, the evidence on sort of the ACE2 receptor in the gut is very new. So I, I need to go and look into that more. But we do know from the organic acid testing that We've got two enzymes, IDO and TDO, that can get upregulated that essentially influence that tryptophan metabolic pathway. Um, and that pathway goes to produce your kynurenic acid or your quinolinic acids, which are two markers that are looked at in the test. Those enzymes can be upregulated as a result of inflammation, as a result of kind of chronic um, upregulation of cortisol, so kind of chronic stress. Dysglycemia, imbalances in blood sugar levels can contribute to it, I think, as well. So it's always asking that question of why. So from that perspective, we're kind of saying, OK, well, we need to go and understand, is there chronic upregulation in cortisol output? Where's the inflammation coming from? Is it a viral infection, a parasitic infection, um, chronic stress, diets, leaky gut, et cetera? And you're trying to just work your way to the first domino in the line of dominoes that's fallen over. So we have some things to consider from that perspective, from a sort of a specifically COVID ACE2 receptor gut at this point in time, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think there's anything out there that has specifically looked into it. I would like to think that to some degree, the interventions that we've discussed may modify it a little bit, um, but I need to go away in all honesty and kind of dig into yeah. it to see if there yeah. is anything. Um, another thing actually is to, to ask your view on is 
probiotics. So what is your view on taking a specific species of probiotic or going for a wider range of species as a, as a single solution? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what is best you, you, you should have, uh, you have a, a score on your test, which says diversity of uh, uh, bacterial species. So if you take a solution which contains 30 uh, different species, obviously the score would go up, but it not necessarily would address the main symptoms that people will have with disrupted gut. So what is, how does that variety of species addresses the problem of uh, low uh, value of keystone species? Yeah, so on this, um, I mean, there's evidence for both um, sort of interventions. So if you take, just because I presented on it recently, the gut skin access, we've got research that just, you know, a random broad spectrum probiotic sometimes is really helpful for acne or psoriasis, for example. So I think we're at this stage in the research whereby, where possible, using a specific strain of probiotic for a specific purpose um, is the best option because that's a very evidence-based way to do it. However, in a lot of situations, we don't yet have that evidence that a specific strain can do this specific thing. So that's where the broad spectrum probiotic, I still think has a place within potential sort of protocols. Um, you have the likes of Dr. Ruscio in the States who advocates for what he refers to as triple probiotic therapy. So he'll say, we'll take a broad spectrum lacto bifido blends, take Saccharomyces boulardii, which is the only sort of yeast strain probiotic on the market. And he says, take a soil based probiotic as well. Um, and then you're kind of almost getting the boast of the three different types of probiotics that we have available to us. I think it all plays well when when you don't have COVID destructed microbiome, and it may make huge sense to to follow this route. But I should always refer to the um, test result from Dr. Carlo Broni, as Mark also suggested when. COVID has demonstrated bacteriophage behavior. And this is the thing when we should not look into SARS as the virus, and we need to look deeper into understanding what is happening with keystone species that are affected uh, after that. So, and in, at this point, uh, Prausnitsi is affected as a keystone species. This is why long haulers have it at a low level. And then we come to the problem whether we need to supplement keystone species with Prausnitsi or we need to identify another solution. So this is very challenging thing. And um, in terms of your company and uh, the lab, um, what do you have uh, in your toolkit to look at this or you yeah. know, this somehow to address it? Yeah, so in regards to kind of increasing the keystone species, there's obviously, I mean, prebiotics are one of the go-tos. So the downside to probiotics is uh, within sometimes a couple of weeks, there's no evidence that you took that probiotic. So we once used to think that, you know, a probiotic was having a long-term impact and they would colonize, but that doesn't seem to be the case. So although probiotics have some evidence that sometimes they can increase some of these organisms, prebiotics would be um, a more appropriate intervention because it's the fertilizer for the soil, so to speak. Can um, I just, yeah, sorry to interrupt, something like inulin, trickery roots, is that what you're referring yeah, to? so things like inulin, there's a prebiotic called partially hydrolyzed guar gum that can be good for the butyrate producers, but then also polyphenols. So we mentioned, you know, the, the things that give plants their color Polyphenols have been shown to increase Acomandia, for example, which is a keystone species. So there are various products on the market that are kind of polyphenol complexes. They all contain extracts of things like green tea, cranberries, pomegranate seed, dark cocoa, um, medicinal mushrooms. Um, and some of these sort of ingredients have been shown to increase some of these keystone species. So from, from my perspective, um, prebiotics and polyphenols are two of the ways that we can go about increasing some of these keystone species like Acomans of Fecalibacterium and Rosburia. Um, 
I think there's even some evidence on omega-3 fatty acids with some of the keystone species. They're, they're definitely being discussed more and more as having prebiotic properties, um, certainly to some of those butyrate producers. Um, so that might be another option. I couldn't say off the top of my head whether there's any evidence on some of those keystone species, but they definitely can with butyrate. Um, because you've also, as a quick final point, got the kind of cross-feeding which is, you know, some bacteria producing metabolites, which are the food for other bacteria. So can you increase the second bacteria without actually increasing the first? So it's actually by increasing the quantities of other guys, you're going to be increasing the keystone species as well. And that's another example of kind of the complexity that we have within that ecosystem. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe uh, the last, not the least, condition would be how you go about the detoxifying intestines. Uh, is there anything uh, on a plate uh, in terms of that? Because we know bacteriophages produce conotoxins and we need to get rid of toxins as the first and main step in uh, from the list of interventions so how to detoxify intestines what are the solutions that uh, might be useful do you know i don't not within that specific context i mean there are i guess in my space there are um, binders or sequestering agents that are used um, but i don't know if they have evidence from that specific context. Um, we use them a lot in things like mycotoxin and mold related illness or histamine mm -hmm. issues. So, you know, things like charcoal, bentonite, clay, mm -hmm. um, chlorella, etc. But from a sort of a phage perspective, I, I am not sure if there's any evidence there at all. Sure. Sure. Thank you very much, Alex, for your time. Uh, I hope people will get to your website and learn about your test that you can offer. So thank you for your time. Thank you for this information. We will share this knowledge with others. Uh, so everyone has got access to it, but maybe the, the most uh, worrying question is how to get to the lab without GP, uh, with the, you know, can they do the test on their own uh, as they wish to test their gut microbiome? Because not all GPs believe in disrupted gut health. <laughs> so how ca can they get access to these tests from UK or elsewhere? Yeah, so at the moment we're primarily sort of UK based. Um, so they can visit our website, healthpath.com. Um, we do offer kind of free 15 minute consults um, if people want to kind of actually speak to us and have some questions around what tests might be most appropriate. So we're obviously here to help people understand what's what's best for them. There are times when we actually think the test isn't the most appropriate thing and actually working with a practitioner one to one would be a, a better use of money, for example. So um, we will always point people in the best direction that we can. Um, so, yeah, that's healthpath.com. Um, to learn more about the testing and to be able to order it. And we will be getting a discount code out to you guys later today as well for everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Thank you Mark. very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you, and bye-bye.